Did the father give him the robe and kick him in the butt and say, go back to the pig pen? God doesn't do that with us either. Why do we want to go back to our sin? Why do we not want to leave it? Why do we not want God to change us and revive us and reform us? And the only answer I can come up with is because we're comfortable in our sin. We truly are the church of Laodicea. We're blinded, we're naked, we're poor, and in that condition we are wretched. For every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and what? All of its fullness. Everything belongs to God. Here's a question for you to think about. When God in the Old Testament <coughs> wanted sacrifices of bulls and goats, and lambs. Was it because he ate blood or he drank blood and ate flesh? No. no. That's the pagan God. God does not drink blood or need the flesh of animals. And this is what these two verses are talking about. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God what? Praise, praise your God because he is worthy of praise. Praise Him because He has done everything to save you. Praise Him because He will not leave you in your sinful state. Praise Him because of His great and magnificent love that is shown to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. What does verse 15 say? Call upon me in the day of trouble and what will God do? And I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Have any of you ever read this song? Do you know what verse 16 says? He changes his whole focus and point of view. Now he deals with the hypocrites, the ones who want the benefit of the covenant, but don't want to live according to what his terms are. Those who want God to save them, but they want the devil to to be their best friend here on this earth. Verse 16, but to the what? <laughs> but to the wicked, God says, what right have you to, what? What is that verse saying? To the wicked, God says, what right do you have to declare my statutes? Have you thought about that? Those are the people who are claiming that God is their father, that they love him, that he's going to save them, but yet their lives have nothing to show that God is living within them. Those were the conditions of the scribes and the Pharisees in Jesus' day, who were the teachers of God, and yet their hearts were so far from him. The prophet was right when he said, these people draw close to me with their what? With their lips. But their heart is far away from them. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to declare my statutes or to take my covenant in your mouth? Seeing you hate instruction, you don't want to be told what to do, you don't want to be told how to live, you don't want your sins brought out. Let me ask you a question Is sex outside of marriage a sin? Yes. yes. Is cohabitation a sin? Yes. Then why do the churches accept it? Ha! I like it. So you come and put something in the offering plate. Listen, that's not a wrong statement. That's that is pretty accurate. That is pretty accurate. Where are we as a culture? Where are we as God's people? We want to claim Jesus Christ. But our lives do not show that He has changed us, that He has transformed us. Our culture is so wicked. But it's no more wicked than Paul's culture. Actually, that culture was a lot more wicked if you ever knew what was going on in those pagan temples. Okay? And yet, we flirt with sin. 
we live in sin, and we don't allow Jesus to cleanse us and take that sin away. And we bring it into the church. Do you know what the biggest sin in the church today is? Anybody? That's not a rhetorical question. Apathy. Apathy? That's a good one. And, and, and that's right up there. The biggest sin in the church today is hatred and unlove. And that trumps apathy. Because that's why you have apathy. It's because we have allowed the culture of our nation, the division of our politics, to separate us in the body of Christ. We will throw names at each other, conservative, liberal. Do you realize if you went to the last, the, the last church that I went to and, and, and taught in, they would have viewed me as being extremely liberal? Okay? Uh, and then uh, if you would have been there in that same church with the pastor before that, you would have, they would have labeled me extremely conservative. Did I change? No. Am I liberal? Yes. Am I conservative? Yes. Because I do not adhere to a specific political agenda. And that's all that is about, is an agenda. What I adhere to is Jesus Christ. Amen. Was Jesus conservative? Oh, yes. Was Jesus liberal? Oh, yes. And Jesus told us that we have to love each other. He did not tell me that I had to make you guys into my image. And I'm not here to form you into that image. He told me that I have to love you where you're at, who you are, and what your belief system is. And that's what he tells you to do for each other. Okay? It's hard to do, isn't it? I'm going to rewrite the contract if we want to, to fit our need of the market. In other words, everything we have is on the lease. Mm -hmm. And I want to rewrite the lease. There you go. Yep. Hypocrisy and pride. You gotta pay for this to follow Christ and have it come in your heart. You gotta pay, it's not free. And he said that on the original contract. Why do we have to rewrite it all the time? Why do we have to keep preaching? Because ignorance is fear. We don't know what perfection is. We cannot comprehend it in our feeble little brain. It does not work. I'm comfortable with sin, but yeah. I know that it's all that. I've done it before. I know how it's going to come out. Pop's going to bust me on the rear. To the wicked, God says, What right have you to declare my statutes or to take my covenant in your mouth, seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you? When you saw a thief, you consented with him and have been a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silence. This next part of this verse, think about this. You thought that I was altogether like you. We get so comfortable in sin that we think God is like us. That it's okay. God understands. Better read the next part of that verse. You thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set in order before your eyes. It may be a supplied word in there, them. And set them in order before your eyes. Verse 22, now consider this, you who forget God. What's the next part of that verse? Consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces. Does God sound like he's playing there? Do you understand what it's going to mean to stand before a holy God if Christ is not your cover? You will see that tempestuous fire. You will understand what it means that he will tear you in pieces. God is a holy and righteous God, but he's also a God of infinite love. But you have to have Christ to gain the, what would be the word? If you want the benefits of Christ, if you want the benefits of salvation, 
then you have to do what God says you need to do, and that is accept Him, submit to Him, and allow Him to live in your life. If you don't do that, then the benefits of His death will not cover you. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoever offers praise glorifies me. And to him who orders his what? What does God expect from us? God expects us to do three things. Okay? Have mercy. Do justly. And walk humbly with your God. Okay? Love. Walk in an upright manner. And walk humbly with and before your God. This is why he says right there in that verse that we are to offer him praise. Isn't it funny that God says, listen to me or I'll tear you in pieces. And what is he wanting? He wants you to offer praise of thanksgiving. Praise for what? Praise for what God has done to change you. To take you from the sinner that you were. And he's made you into the saint that you are now. But understand that in this flesh, I can be a sinner this moment and a saint the next moment. A sinner the next moment, the saint the next moment. It's only in Christ that I am a saint from beginning to end. <coughs> Justified and sanctified in Christ. Whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct or rights, I will show the salvation of God. So listen, if you think that obedience has nothing to do with your salvation, you might want to read that last verse over and over and over again until you realize that you cannot call on Christ and take His name and be disobedient. It doesn't work that way. That's Old Testament. You find the same thing in the New Testament. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I tell you to do? On that day, there will be many who call me Lord, Lord, and I'll say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. Obedience comes with the following of Christ. You have to submit, and with submission comes obedience. And that's why the church needs revival, and that's why the church needs reformation, and that's why Jesus hasn't come yet, because we do not submit and we do not obey. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 309.
sisters um, take a seat. In this last stanza, stanza four of I Surrender All, it says, All to Jesus I surrender. Now I feel the sacred flame. Oh, the joy of full salvation. Glory, glory to his name. Do you know what the joy of full salvation is? Do you realize that when Jesus comes in your heart and you give your life fully to him, he has saved you from every sin, past, <coughs> present, and future. And that when he says he will separate you from your sin as far as the east is from the west, from the depth of the very deepest part of the ocean, that's how far he separated your sin from you, he means it. The joy of full salvation is that you will never have to make an explanation for the sins of your past. And brothers and sisters, when you meet him, all your sins will be in the past. But you live this life today, and you can live it in full salvation, knowing that your sins are covered. The blood of the Lamb is big enough to cover all the sins of every person who's ever lived from the fall of Adam to the second coming of Jesus Christ. That is some big grace. That is some full cleansing of sin. David wrote, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be cleansed. Wash me, and I shall be what? Whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew in me a steadfast spirit. David, and he wrote that after his sin with Bathsheba, when Nathan the prophet came to him and told him. If David could be forgiven of that, there is nothing that God can forgive you of. Amen. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew in me a steadfast spirit. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take away your Holy Spirit from me. That's what David said. That's what we need. Brothers and sisters, as we close this service, as many of us who can, let us bow in prayer as I close us out. Father, the words that I spoke this morning were not soothing words, were not comforting words. They were words that were direct, words that were to the point, words that at times were harsh. But Father, we need to wake up from our spiritual slumber from this stupor that we're in, and we need to see our true condition. Father, I pray that each one of us, and Lord, I am first in this line, help me and help us to understand our true condition and our true standing before you. Father, take the blinders away from our eyes that we may see our sin and bring it to you. Help us to realize that there is nothing in this life that is so pleasurable so fun, so entertaining, that it's worth giving up heaven for. And Father, help us also to understand that you are holy, and you are righteous, and you are pure, and that's what you call your people to be. You call us to obey your precepts, you call us to keep your law, and you have given us the power to do that through the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. Father, we want revival, and we want reformation. But it will not happen unless we submit to your will. And the only thing I can see, Father, is if it hasn't happened yet, it means we're not submitting. Father, you know the prayers that I pray for this church and for its people. You know the burden on my heart to see a revival come here. You know that what I want is not to have any of your people that are here today lost on that day. But that I may see their faces. That I may be there. That I may not preach the gospel and turn out to be shipwrecked or cast away. But that I would submit as well. Father, you have cleansed us from our sin. All we have to do is ask and you do it. Help us to submit to your will. Help us not to live lives the way we want but help us to live this life the way you want. 
For this I ask, for this I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.